Okay. Shabbat Shalom. All praise be the Most High, higher than with Yeshaya. When we come before you, brothers and sisters, this Sabbath, we would like to say Shalom. Uh, before we begin, let me first do the Hebrew credo. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God in Hebrew, and we, we will repeat it back in English. Shema Yasha Allah Ahaya Allah Nawa Ahaya Akkad. 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 Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Yeah, okay. All right, what we'll do first is we'll read out of the law real quick. Let's go to Deuteronomy 6. Let's get Leviticus 19 real quick. Leviticus 19. Mm -hmm. We're going to do this real quick and then go right into the lesson, all right? Okay. Leviticus 19 have 37 verses. All right? So we're going to do uh, six each. Let's do, yeah, yeah, let's do seven verses each, and the last person just read all the way through, right? Leviticus 19. And Ahia spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto all the congregations of the children of Israel, and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I am the Most High, your God, am holy. Ye shall fear every man his mother and his father, and keep my Sabbaths. I am the Most High, your power. Turn ye not unto idols, nor make to yourselves molten gods. I am your power, your God. And if you offer a sacrifice of peace, offerings unto the Lord, unto the Most High, you shall offer it at your own will. It shall be eaten the same day ye offer it. And on unto the third day, it shall be burnt in the fire. And if it be eaten at all on the third day, it is an abomination. It shall not be accepted. Uh, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 8. Therefore, every one that eat of it shall bear his iniquity, because he hath profaned the hallowed thing of the Most High. And that soul shall be cut off from among his people. And when you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of thy field, neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of thy harvest. And thou shalt not glean thine vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grape of thine vineyard. Thou shalt leave them for the poor and stranger. I am the Most High your power. Ye shall not steal, neither deal falsely, neither lie one to another. And ye shall not swear by my name falsely, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy power, I am the Most High. Thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor, neither rob him. The wages of him that is hired shall not abide with thee all night until the morning. Thou shalt not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shalt fear thy power. I am the Most High. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 15. <clears throat> ye, shall, ye shall do no unright, unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt, thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. Thou shalt not go up and down as, as a tell bearer among thy people, 
Neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am, I am the most high. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thy heart. Thou shalt, not, thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy brother, and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any, any grudge against, against the children of, of thy people. But thou shalt love thy neighbor as thy love as thyself. I am the most high. Ye shall keep my statutes. Thou shalt not let thy cattle gender with with a diverse kind. Thou shalt not thou shalt not sow thy field with mingled seed. Neither shall a garment mingled of linen and of woman come upon thee. And who and who hold on, twenty. And whosoever life Carnally, with a woman that is a, a bondmaid, betroth, betrotheth to an uh, betrotheth to an husband, and not at all redeemed nor freedom given her, she, she shall be she shall be scored. They they shall they shall not be put to death because she was not free, and he shall bring his trespass his trespass offering upon the most high. Unto the door of, of the tab of the tabernacle of the congregation, even a ram for for a trespass offering. Uh, verse twenty two, and priests shall make an atonement for him with the ram of the trespass offering before the Most High, for the sin which he hath done, and the sin which he hath done shall be forgiven. Twenty three, and when he shall come into the land, and shall have planted all manner of trees for food, then you shall count the fruit thereof. As uncircumcised. Three years shall it be as uncircumcised to you. It shall not be eaten up. Verse 24. But in the fourth year, all the fruit thereof shall be holy to praise the most high of all. And, and in the fifth year shall he eat of the fruit thereof, that it may yield unto you the increase thereof. I am the most high of all. Verse 26. And you shall not eat anything. Uh, you shall not eat anything with the blood. You shall not eat anything with the blood. Neither shall ye use enchantment nor observe times. Twenty-seven. And Enchantment shall... is witchcraft, and observe times is also dealing with things like horoscopes and going to people for the future and all that. Go on. Verse 27, and you shall not round the corners of your head, neither shalt thou bar the corners of thy bed. Now I wanted to go here in Leviticus 19 because so many people get this confused when it says you cannot, when it says um, you shall not round the corners of your head, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. You have people out there ignorantly, there's so many points in Leviticus 19. But I wanted to point this out because many people come there and say, well, you're not supposed to get a haircut <laughs> without the knowledge of what was going on with this particular uh, sin. OK, this is actually someone cutting their hair and all that in their beard to mimic gods, to worship different gods. Like you may see some of these Satanists out there and these, these sadists. They got these big things in their ear and they're marring their hair a certain type of way. It was to mimic or to worship other gods. It had nothing to do with someone getting a haircut. And the example we can give people is the markings and the hairstyles and the facial cuttings of those that you may witness on certain uh, indigenous tribes. Like when you, uh, if you look at the movie Apocalypto, they were cutting their, they were marring their hair and making print on themselves to gods or to the dead. That's what that was talking about. That's not saying you cannot get an edge up. Okay. Says, when, yeah. When, as well, when you go into the, um, the, the Hebrew, the word mar is actually a permanent thing. So yeah. Something they're doing to their, to their hair. Their hair permanent. Their hair permanently. Exactly. It's a permanent action they're doing to the gods they're marring themselves like you see a lot of people Satanists does this all the time today when you see them with the all black on and they got their hair shaved and certain things and they're permanently doing things to themselves putting pierces all through themselves and all that 
all that uh, evil, tattooing themselves from head to toe. This is what the Bible was speaking of, right? Go on. Leviticus, Leviticus 19 and 28. 19 and 28, come on. You shall not make any cuts in your flesh from the dead, nor print any marks upon you like the most high. See how it connects all that together? The, the, the rounding the head, the marring the corners of the beard, on top of that, while doing that, they're doing what? They're making cuttings in their flesh and prints and marks upon their flesh for the dead. These were all ritualistic marrings hmm. of one's temple. The Gentiles were doing this to other gods. The, the Canaanite priests were doing this. Okay? And you had the Canaanite priests operating <clears throat> and uh, over their congregations. And what would happen is when people wanted to get to certain ranks amongst the people, they would go to these priests and the priests would do all these things to them. And it was like a it was like getting your stripes and moving up in evil rankings back then. One would have this mark and you would know that he's a chief. One would have this mark and you would know that he's in, you know, he's over provinces and things of that nature. The Canaanite priests would do this. It wasn't like having in the military where they give you stripes today. They would mark the body to show your ranking. Or if you were a certain warrior, they would do certain markings too so that everyone know not to mess with you because you, you, are, you are a killer. They was doing these things to the gods. So I wanted to give, let people know there's a clear understanding of this. Like when uh, we do it on a low level by going to print shops and all that. And if someone we care about or someone that passed, we get tattoos on our body. Well, that's a lower level thing compared to what was going on then, but it falls into the same thing. Markings for the dead. We mar ourselves and cut ourselves. A lot of people cut themselves. don't even know why they're cutting themselves. Demonic possession. Okay. Printing on themselves. All of these things. And what they did was they made it, they made these things mainstream. They made the evil worships and markings to the gods mainstream by opening up tattoo shops all over the place. Okay. All right, come on, let's 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 go through this because this is not really the the key thing I wanted to touch on. But I I want to go to Leviticus 19. First of all, I was going to read out of the law, mm -hmm. but I thought we would go to scriptures that brothers and sisters out there run into, but misinterpret. Okay. Also, I wanted to go into where in Leviticus 19, which is a good chapter, it talks about not bearing a grudge against your brother and sister, brothers or sisters, harboring ill feelings against a brother or sister. And on top of a grudge, one being a tail bearer running up and down, just talking about everything, whether it's true or not. That's a wicked and evil thing. Where one just every place they go, they're telling people all these things up and down, spreading rumor and all that. And most people don't even realize that it's, it's against the most high for this. They just do it naturally, you know, as a regular, you know, as regular social interaction. Right. Where we left off at. Uh, uh, verse 29. Come on. Do not prostitute thy daughter to cross her to be a whore. And it says, do not prostitute thy daughter, in Leviticus 19, to be a whore. Right? Now, it's a shame because a lot of people don't know what this means. Okay? <laughs> it's talking about straight prostitution, but also the things that lead to a girl being promiscuous. A young lady being promiscuous. Like I see when, you, when we walk in our neighborhoods... You see our sisters have these tight clothes and these little shorts and all that on little girls. Okay. They be having these little things trying to make a little girl look sexy. Okay. That's, that's prostituting your daughter. Because why? There's pedophiles out there. There's people out there that are, get sexually, that are sexually attracted to children. See, and they think it's cute. Oh, yeah, put on those little boom shorts and all that for these little girls and all that. And it's really out there. You're showcasing your daughters. And when she grow up, she'll believe that this is 
uh, natural fashion. She would think growing up like this, it was cute. Everybody looked at, look at those cute things on her. And now a girl, a young lady will believe it's normal. She's being taught to walk and operate like a harlot as normal. See? Mm. Come on. Vegas 1929. Do not prostitute thy daughter, daughter to cause her to be a whore. That's the land falls to whore. That land become full of wickedness. It's because a land falls to whore and it becomes what? Full of wickedness. Full of wickedness. These are the things that lead to a defiled land. See? But yet our society perpetuates the spirit of hoarding. You look at the videos and look at what's going on with the young girls out there. Guys are actually going online just looking at girls, young girls. They're out there with little shorts on, twerking and all these things. Those are the things that defile a land. And not, not even realizing, not even understanding the overall long-term impact this is going to have on a nation, on your people, on your family. Your children want to grow up and see mom, you know, on videos. See her operating and just showing her derriere all over the place and operate with one man to the next. What does that do for future generations? Right? And I'm just giving you an example how, mm -hmm. hey, this world is defiled. This land is tainted. There's no coming back from this. Right? What we're doing is, according to Christ, is setting the path so that brothers and sisters can find the right way before judgment. That's what the law is. It's not pointing out somebody and judging them and saying something is wrong with them and what's wrong with them. The most are going to do this or do that. No, we're pointing out that the, no, the things that we have accustomed ourselves to believe is right or, or normal is actually sin according to the Bible. Which is, which is the reason for the law. The law gives you that line of right from wrong. It gives you that path and say, well, listen, through ignorance, your society taught you to be this way without judgment. But this is what the Most High intended for a holy and righteous people. And then now you have, you as a son or daughter of the Most High, have a choice now to choose the right path. Right? Read on. Verse 30, you shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary unto the Lord. 31, regard not them that have familiar spirits. It says, regard not them that have familiar spirits. These are people that deal with mediums or claim that they talk to spirits and all that and or talk to spirits. It says, regard not them that have familiar spirits. These are also people that are in the church saying that they have a word or discernment and can tell you the future concerning yourself. And you think they're getting this discernment from the God of the Bible. They have familiar spirits. They're demon-possessed people in these whorehouses called churches. Come on. Neither seek after wizards to be the foul Bible. Neither seek after a wizard. Someone who could do what? Give you types of resolving of charms and all that a person who can put a root on people or take a curse off of a person people that can give you love potions or tell you what to do or what what to do to get money and all these things don't seek after that these people are being guided by demons they've already given themselves over as hosts go on i am the lord your god i am the lord thy power the, thy power so the Most High is saying is, you, you, you come to me for everything. Okay, if you want to know the future, let me show you the future according to prophecy, according to what was written from the beginning. Read my word and I can show you what's going to happen. Okay, it's in my word. Don't go to them for that, for that temporal fix according to the future. Because they don't dictate the future. At the end of this, the future belongs to the Most High. <laughs> you don't go to wizards and all that. You don't go to people for prosperity and all these. You do what's right and the most time will do what? He will bless you in his time. See? Go, he says, look, you don't got to go to them. That's what he's telling you in the law. Come to me. <laughs> you don't need these, these little de demonic peons because everything they've given you is temporal anyway. 
follow my law, follow my commandments, and I can show you what's going to happen. I'll give you the wisdom. I'll give you the understanding. I'll bestow on you riches. If it mean now you will use those things, th those possessions and riches to do what? Bring forth my kingdom and help the poor and change your society, change those around you. That's what it's about. It's not about, you know, the, the spirit of prosperity and what they're teaching you. Right? The Most High is saying, the High is saying, listen, come to me for this. You don't need no wizards. You need no sources. You don't need no horoscopes. You don't need none of this. Come to me. Right? Next verse. Verse 32. Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the feast of the old man. And fear by God, I am the most high. <clears throat> Verse 33. And if a stranger sojourn with thee... A stranger is a Gentile. Now if a Gentile is sojourning amongst you, read. You shall not vex him. You shall not vex him. So you can't make a Gentile feel less than you. You cannot make them feel that they are rejected of the Most High. You can't vex them. Okay? Now this is not talking about relationships and marriage. This is talking about, just say, if a Gentile family that's together is to join in amongst you. Well, we must treat them like family. Because why? When we go into Gentiles to join in amongst us, automatically the carnal mind of think interracial marriage. And it has nothing to do with that. You had, a, you had whole families of strangers operating amongst Israel. And what happened? We treated them like family. We operated with them accordingly. Why? Because they followed our God and scorned their God and, and rejected the God of their fathers. Read on. Verse 34. But the stranger that dwelleth with you shall be as one born amongst you. Read it again. But the stranger that dwelleth with you shall be as one born amongst you. He shall be as one born amongst you, read. And thou shalt love him as thyself. Thou shalt love him as thyself. For ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. He says, because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Now, before this Canaanite came up that ended up destroying and coming in as Pharaoh over Egypt, guess what? The Egyptians embraced us. Look at the story of Joseph when he became second to the king and was embraced by strangers in Egypt. So this tells us, this is not talking about a stranger amongst our own people. This is talking about a Gentile. See? It's saying right here, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. They embraced you. And a lot of people don't know that that Assyrian that became Pharaoh over Egypt that put us in captivity there for 210 years. He was from the land of Canaan. He took over Assyria. He, and Assyria was paying tribute to this Canaanite king. And that, that's the guy that became Pharaoh. There arose up a king or Pharaoh over Egypt that Joseph didn't know. That was a Canaanite king that ruled and took over parts of Assyria. That's why he was called the Assyrian who vexed us or oppressed us in Egypt when you read the Bible. He was, a, he was a Canaanite king that was over Assyria and took over all the Nile Valley areas. And eventually he became what? Pharaoh over Egypt and began to oppress us. Right? And, and that's a lesson that's coming very soon, right? Come on. Verse 35. You shall do no unrighteousness in judgment, and meet and meet your in weight for a measure. Thirty six. Just promises, just weights, a just ephod, and a just hen shall ye have. I am the most high of power, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Come on. Thirty seven. Therefore shall you observe all my statutes and all my judgments, and do them. I am the Lord. I am the most high. Leviticus nineteen is a great chapter concerning moral and civil civil law amongst each other and how to serve the most high but yet reject the 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 imposition or what you would call society's way of operating you'll understand and decipher 
what you can operate with or deal with within the world and what to shun according to the world. Okay? Now, one moment here. <clears throat> okay. Now, that's the Vedicus 19. Is there something else I wanted to, to go into? Yeah. And like I was mentioning, excuse me, because it went out of my mind for a moment. Like I was mentioning earlier, brothers and sisters, that we're going into different parts of history, like uh, showing who that Pharaoh was. You understand that took over Egypt or became this this Pharaoh that we didn't know. A lot of brothers and sisters don't, don't realize that there's different ethnicities and different nations that rule Egypt as Pharaoh. And that's a lot of things we go into that, that I will go into in the academy. You know, when it comes to uh, the Hyksos period and showing how all those areas were intertwined and different kings came in and ruled Egypt because Egypt was like the capital, like the United States have a capital, like Washington, D.C. Well, every president is not from Washington, D.C., but they go and rule the capital once they gain power or get elected. Well, we're going to show we, we're showing in this academy how these things were so. It wasn't just Egyptians ruling in Egypt. That was more so the capital of that area. And we're going to show you who those kings were. So I'm saying this to say, brothers and sisters, for those who haven't taken this academy, you really have to <laughs> become a part of it. Because this that gives us the time, not just a few hours on the Sabbath or whatever. That gives us a time to really dove into the scriptures on a scholastic level for you all and to interact with you. You understand? So, hey, I'm going to say, if you haven't <laughs> you've been a part of this academy, you're missing out, especially in this time where knowledge is increasing and you really need to be able to focus the information you're receiving that's even out there and resolve it. But the academy every Sunday, early in the morning, give us the opportunity to do that. We have Elder Lawyer coming in with Hebrew 101 who does a great job. As you know, I'll put out some of the videos with myself in Shapat with the news. And uh, we have lessons that's sent to you. And we have pages where you can go and view your documents, your information. So you can go to historytimes.org. Gathering as one at AOL.com is our email. And you can go to gatheringofchrist.org if you want to be a part of it. I'm telling you. Because when I was just reading this thing and it went into, and I was talking about the Pharaoh and all that, it came it came to mind some of the information we show in, in the academy. And a lot of you here on the Sabbaths, you get the Sabbath information, and that's once a week. And I know the Most High blessed us to come before you on the Sabbath, but there's a lot of information that you need to have, that you could have real time if you're a part of the academy. So make sure, <laughs> you know, you do something to get in there. Right? Now, going straight into the lesson. Now, initially, this wasn't going to be a lesson, um, but after dealing with the leadership course, the second week of our leadership course, what we have going on is a leadership course amongst the elders that show the different facets according to Christ, the Most High, the Holy Spirit, on how to deal with uh, a leadership position when it comes to counseling, judgment, and different, you know, scenarios that might happen amongst the church. How we must stand in wisdom like Solomon did in certain circumstances. How when Moses was, was leading the children of Israel in the wilderness, how his father-in-law Jethro told him to set up a council to judge the people a certain way and set up men to do so who were wise and had the knowledge of the Most High to judge righteously. And how can we implement that wisdom of counsel within each of our churches where it's a uniform, equitable place so that the sheep, the people who are also being raised as leaders for one day, can be guided righteously? Well, so much information came out of that particular class that myself, Shapat, Elder Lawyer did with the elders throughout the earth that I thought that it would be a, a good thing to touch on some of these points so that when brothers and sisters gather within our church uh, in any respective areas 
so that you so that you can know exactly what to expect concerning judgment. Okay, why? We have to keep in mind, brothers and sisters, that, and I'm talking about those that gather, those that are looking to gather with the church and all that. First of all, we have to realize that, number one, uh, there's a lot of trust issues out there, and, and understandably so, after coming out of the Christian church, right? There's a lot of people in the Christian church, a lot of churches that are set up, just it's just set up wrong. And through that, have uh, materialized a, you know, a non-trust sentiment amongst people who believe in the Most High God. Well, what's going to happen in this church? Okay, you got the Eddie Long thing. You have the prosperity gospel that have actually destroyed churches at its root. You have women pastors who have overrun the church. You have all types of things going on in the churches with no pious and righteous judgment. Why? We all know why there's no righteous judgment. Because in the church, they're telling people the law is done away with and all things are relative and you choose the law that you must follow according to your heart and Christ will forgive the rest. Now, that's the mindset in the churches. I can't blame them because they weren't set up according to the most High from the beginning. They were set up by the whore church, the Roman Catholic church. So we can't point and blame them for not being right because that path was never right. The only thing that's right in that is the fact that Christ is the key point character or or emphasis within that. But not too many people study Christ there. So getting off that, it still doesn't change the mindset of those who have come out of that and are now looking for what's next. But knowing that it's a lie now, but that non-trust factor is still there, right? So, you know, indirectly, those that they run into are now being judged to some degree or being held to certain standards based on the ill experience from the church, understandably so. Right. So we thought that as under a leadership course, that we would have a thing set up for discerning and understanding that these are the most highs people. They're his sheep. And regardless of what they're going through, they should have righteous judgment amongst the body of Christ. They should have proper counseling, judgment and spiritual discernment. OK, and they should learn that from elders who are established, right? Like for instance, right? And we tell brothers and sisters all the time, you must be patient when you gather or come into a church and not just be ready to jump into a relationship or do this or find a person and all these things. Why? Because you have to keep in mind the majority of people that are coming into the truth now are fairly new and are baptized, and on top of that, are you know, are still struggling with the old man. And a lot of people, when they come into the truth, they think that they're just sitting amongst all saints that are pure with white, and are covered with total purity, and are without sin. So, so elders had to, we had to set up, a, you know, how the churches we had to put put a mechanism in that was established how the old churches were so that the brothers and sisters will know, well, listen, you're coming in to truth and that's coming from the elders that are teaching, but you have to really be aware of, of what's going on and build a, what you would call trust factor amongst the body outside the elders. And that trust factor comes with you first learning about everyone before you jump into something with everyone. Everything in this earth right now is just instant. You want everything, you want it now because that's the internet. Now, now, now. But when you come amongst the body, you must exercise patience. Right? And I'm going to go into a few things here when it comes to counseling, judgment, and spiritual discernment. Because why? Let's get into the Bible now. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 6. 
and 9. Mm -hmm. Right? Now check check out what Paul is writing to the church of Corinth. Read. <clears throat> uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and no, verse... No, 5, excuse me. 1 Corinthians yeah. chapter 5 and verse 9. Yes, 5 and 9, that's it. I write unto you an epistle not to company with fornicators. He says, I write unto you an epistle not to company with fornicators. Read. Verse 10. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world. Not just the fornication, fornicators of this world. So Paul has said, we're not supposed to company with fornicators. A fornicator is something that's deal someone who's dealing with ardent sexual activity. Just like you may have a brother or a sister that struggles with being with one person. And, or the, you, you know, a lot of people went through that struggle and realized, you know, the, the drawbacks that come with, with not dedicating yourself, right? But, but this world is teaching it's okay to just deal with anyone you want without consequence. That's a fornicator. That's a whoremonger according to the Bible. Right. You have people who would teach it's OK to have many women and all that. Well, these are fornicators. You can have a, a woman who, who, who may believe, well, OK, this didn't work out. Well, let me just sleep with another person or deal with another person. Hopefully this will work out. That's fornicating. And then you have what you would call uh, deviant, uh, what they call sexual behavior, like pedophiles. That's a fornicator. Like a homosexual. That's a, form of, that's a fornicator. So according to the church, we weren't supposed to keep company with fornicators like the world do. How sisters have best friends who are so-called gay or homosexual. Or have best friends that you know she's the one girl in your circle that sleeps around wherever she goes. Well, you're not supposed to keep. Why? Because what we're doing is we're aiding a sinful and, and deadly behavior. And, 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 and a lot of our women think this is cute. A lot of brothers th that frequent these things, these people think it's cute or it's cool. No. You're actually aiding this person, you know, with, with agreeing in their sin. Okay? And th this person is hell bound. Now, the only way this person will know that what they're doing is wrong, if people begin to say, you know what, you can't have this friendship like this. You understand? I like you as a person, but this behavior can affect my family, my children. Until you get that together, you can't, you can't come into this circle. Right? Now check, check this out here. It says right here. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to Company with fornicators. Right? Mm -hmm. Read. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world. So Paul say not just those that are doing these things in the world. Read. Or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters. For then must ye needs go out of the world. See that? <laughs> so he's saying, well, listen. You can go out of the world to get some of those or go outside the confines to get some of those. So what is Paul saying? Paul is saying, well, listen, when people come to get baptized in the church, they're, they're getting those former sins cleansed, right? Like when you come to be baptized, we being red with sin, we're under one of these particulars that, that would have led us to hell. Fornicating, drunkards, stealing and all that. So the majority of people that comes into the church to be baptized struggle with these things. So that old man is still what? There. The things they did is still there. there it's forgiven them. But a lot of people struggle with those things even after hearing and dealing in truth. 
So brothers and sisters who are sheep or who may be naive must understand that. You must understand that even though these brothers or sisters may have come to the truth, all of us may still be struggling with something and protect ourselves with that understanding. I'm going to show you what Paul said. Read verse 11. <clears throat> but now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother, if any man that is called a brother, be a fornicator, a fornicator, a covetous, a covetous, an idolater, an idolater, a, or a railer. A railer is someone that's always uh, uh, railing down on something and being brutish and just, you know, trying to, to, to impose their will on people, cursing people. Read. Or a drunkard. Someone that you know, every place <clears throat> they go, they're always drunk, never sober-minded. They always have a beer in their hand or, or something in their hand. You want, this is brothers now. Read. Or an extortioner. You have people that will come in because they used to hustling in the world. They'll come in the church and they'll be looking for someone that they can hustle or get something from. You have to realize the door. There's not an invisible saint door that changes those behaviors. <laughs> you understand? Like these innate uh, spiritual downfalls or these, these spirits that people came in with are still there. They may be struggling or buffeting buffeting these spirits or keeping these spirits down. But all in all, if, if, if they're caught weak, it'll come out. Okay, if they don't recognize uh, what's going on within them and allow that spirit to overtake them, they'll see an opportunity to extort or do whatever. We have to realize that, you know, this is the real world. That's what happens even if people have truth. Temptation can lead them into the old man. Right? Come on. With such an one, no, not to eat. It says, if you know that this is going on, you ain't supposed to be sitting down with people who are dealing with these struggles and all that. Okay? You're not supposed to be sitting with these people. Read the 12th verse. Verse 12. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without do not ye judge them that are within? Yeah, we're always talking about what the world is doing and how the world is evil and they're doing this and they're, they're doing that. Well, if we can talk about that, can't we judge what's within when the same behavior <laughs> is recognized? And see, and this is what we were talking about amongst the elders uh, with our leadership courses because we're judging matters Accordingly, these are the things that comes up in all the things that do what? That stifle the work of Christ. These are all the struggles that, that put a stain on the work of Christ. Right? So, not judging any past things, we said, well, listen, how do we go forward to make sure the proper counsel is in place? To lead and help people with these struggles within the church that are dealing with their issues, but protect the people in the church from those that are struggling with certain things, <laughs> right? Because as elders, you begin to know certain things in confidence, in confidence. You understand? And you know someone's struggling with something, but when they go before the people, the, the people are sheep. The people are nice and we embrace each other, but they have no idea the, you know, the negative potential of, of what can happen when someone is struggling who's sitting right next to them. Right? And you can't just be putting people's business out there. You can't. That, that's unrighteous. So we as elders had to come up with a way to say, you know what? We must judge righteous judgment to have the sheep be aware of what to look for to protect themselves in our absence. Right? That's wisdom. Because what happens is, if someone is coming in struggling with certain things, right? And I'm going to give you an example. 
Uh, I'm going to give you an example, just an overall example. Just say of someone that's used to partying and all that in the world. And they come into the church and they see the people are nice and all that. But instead of a con uh, instead of an orchestrated get together that's overseen by elders who are tasked with protecting the sheep, this person is given a cookout that they invite people to separately. <laughs> now, the only thing he only know one way to, to throw a party. He may mean well, <laughs> right? But now he didn't secretly invited some people to a party. But he only know one way to give a party. See? So even though his intentions are good, he's inviting people in the church to sin. Right? right? And I'm just giving you, that's an overall example that didn't happen, but I'm just showing you an example that, you know, that really, you know, go, go across the board here. That, 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 that goes directly across the board. You can plug anything in. If a sinner is dealing with something and they invite people into it, they only know one way to operate with that until they overcome that. When they overcome the sin and discern, be able to discern between good and evil, they know I can't invite people into this setting. Right? Because I know my struggles concerning that. Matter of fact, I can't even be in these settings because I know myself concerning that. I'm buffered in the flesh. I'm struggling with this, so why should I invite other brothers and sisters into my struggles, into my shortcomings, right? But if you like to get together, which is good, we all go before the elders and say, elders, you know, you know what I mean? I like the social life, but not the evil I was dealing with. I don't I want to do it wrong. How do we get together? And the elders say, listen, we as a church can do a nice cookout where you get the social interactions that you like to have you understand but it has a shepherd over it to oversee to make sure things don't get out of hand to make sure there's no over excess of drinking if drinking at all now if we know brothers are struggling with drinking and all that what we'll do we'll make sure there's no alcohol there so we'll all not drink any alcohol for the sake of that brother that's struggling see now why am i going into this it's a lot of wisdom that the Most High set up to keep order amongst the church that must be implemented at all times within the church. Elders are looked upon and deacons are looked upon as shepherds. Shepherds, right? Which means this sin is usually the wolf that's looking to destroy the sheep, right? So it's not, no person in particular on purpose. It's sin in itself, right? It's, it's the things that were leading us to hell. Those spirits are the wolves. So elders have to be in a position to discern and understand, okay, let me stop this or let me counsel concerning this before it gets out of hand. Full, full understanding of what's going on amongst the sheep, knowing the people, getting to know the people you understand, to protect the body and, and, and by so ushering the body of Christ down the, the correct paths, right? Now, let's get Jeremiah real quick. I went there the other night with the elders. Now, this is going to be a quick class, but I wanted to go into it to show you the direction of the church in your absence when you're not viewing the classes, when, we, when we're not before you and all these things, we're still working to do what? To shape the body of Christ and the work of Christ correctly, even in your absence. You understand, there's, there's much work we must do, okay? Uh, I, I can say this, that, you know, <laughs> we're going to be learning until Christ returns. But all in all, we're doing what we can to, you know, to make this the body of Christ, right? To make this a place of, you know, where, where the people can be protected, right? You have it? Let me get it real quick.
Jeremiah 50. Yeah, Jeremiah 50 and 6. <clears throat> My people have been lost sheep. My people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have caused them to go astray. And it says their sh the shepherds have caused them to go astray. Now let's examine this. Usually the people are blamed in certain circumstances, but the people who come in are merely sheep. Right? A sheep is innocent. A sheep, you understand, uh, doesn't even understand where the dangers are. They come in and they trust everyone equally and feel that everyone has the same intentions as them. It's up to the shepherd to understand the dangers and know the dangers. See that? But it's the shepherds that have caused them to go astray. That's what the Bible says. Why? Because the shepherd wasn't being a shepherd. See? When you look at a shepherd, they see a wolf coming. They do what? They get their stick ready. <laughs> That's the sin there. And they bat that thing away before it has an opportunity to destroy the sheep. Because sheep take care, really take care, take care of everything. They take, they, they take care. When you need, uh, when you need, wool when you need clothing hey it's that sheep so if you let that wolf get that sheep what happens to the clothing they, their food they, they fertilize you know the grass right they fertilize the grass and back then there weren't any any lawnmowers okay so they eat the grass and they keep things nice and neat right but yet, they don't protect themselves from danger. It's the shepherd that need to do that, understanding the worth of a sheep. But it's the sheep, it's the shepherd that caused them to go astray. Be it inordinate sin behavior, or teaching bad behavior, or altogether not protecting the sheep. Right? Because why? Let me give you an example, brothers and sisters. Right? Here's another example. You have people who would just get online and look on Facebook. I don't have a Facebook, thank the most high. But I'm, I'm not coming down on anyone who do have one. I, everyone know my opinion concerning it. That's on you. Right? But they will scroll through things. Right? And they'll go look for a person and they'll they'll hone in on that person for, for, for lustful purposes. Right? You have women that put their things out there and men that put those things out there. And here it is. You think everything is just by chance. It was the spirit of the most high. People got together. I found. No. This Facebook and these other platforms have actually legalized stalkers. That's all it is. If somebody, you know, somebody was in a, in a back room just checking you out and all that. Back when I was growing up, that's a stalker. Right? So you have these people figure out what you're going, going into and what you are about and all that and see how to get in. And actually, you know, they're popping up in the church next to you, sitting next to you as if you, you think that they just found out where you were. They found out your interest. And then they start talking to you about all these things and all that. And you'll be like, man, it seems like you know me. I feel that we have a connection. Yeah, you have a connection. This guy didn't study you for three months. He know your likes, your dislikes. He know your family. He knows everything. But yet he's sitting next to you. And he know. And guess what? Hey, he'll tell you, listen, I'm a part of the gathering of Christ Church. Oh, yeah, man. They dropping the dimes there. And that's, he's sitting there, and then, then he's sitting next to the girl after stalking her for three months. <laughs> you understand? And here it is. He had nothing to do, or she had nothing to do with this, this thing that's about to go down. Right? When I say he has nothing to do, he came in solely with her in mind and not the most high. 
So he had nothing to do with the Most High, be, with, with him being there. And he's, he's sitting right next to him. And then they end up coming together, getting together, or whatever the case is. And then the stuff hits the fan because this guy may be dealing with all types of stuff. And then she looks at us and say, well, or the brother look at us or whoever look at us and say, well, what's going on in your church? Shouldn't you protect this? Shouldn't you have been in position to know that this was going to happen? And it always come down to the, you know, the church would be blamed. But we must understand the world we're in. And see, and that's the conversation I was having with the elders the other day. We must understand the world we're in. Regardless of what happens, we're going to be blamed. Because the Bible blames the shepherds. The people are sheep. What mechanism did we have in place for that? To protect these people. <laughs> Knowing the society uh, we're in today. Right? It's just, that's just the way it is. We can't blame the society. The Most High said this is the society we, we're in. We can't blame this. Even if the brother came in with those intentions, he's still a sheep. What safeguard did we have even in those cases where we can win him concerning his behavior and have him operate as a saint eventually? Right? <laughs> Not blaming the brother because maybe the Most High did all that to have him there. We were supposed to understand that and stop it before it happened and help him see things straight. Right. Because now he's in. He, he's right there in the path now. That's an opportunity for the shepherds, for both people. Right. So. I said, elders, we have a three month course that runs concurrent with the academy where now the elders. Can deal real time. And understanding counseling. Spiritual judgment, spiritual discernment to actually judge things as the most high sees it. According to his instruction. Because why? The most high loved that guy who just caught up in, in, into the stalking and he wanted him to do right. That's why he led him there. Now, the stalker thinks he's there for the girl. <laughs> so the most high knew that, OK, we have the, the, the guy with the problem before us now. Right. <laughs> he knew this sister was really looking for a good man and rather have a man in the truth. Than out there in the world, you know, where where a lot of brothers don't appreciate a good sister. So she in the building saying, well, you know what? I know I can find a good man here because people here fear the most high God and love the most high. And they're in a good church. <laughs> so both of them are there. You right for their own purposes to some degree, you know, on top of getting the law, statutes, and commandments of the Most High. So she's seeing this guy saying, "You know what? Okay, he's cute." Or the things young people deal with today, well, as they always, and say, "Well, okay," you know. And then they begin to have a meeting on the outside of the church and start doing things without proper guidance. No shepherd involved, and we know that's toxic, right? So how do we elders deal with situations, understanding the society we're in today, you might ask? Well, we have to understand the judgment and counsel of the most High, Right. So we came up with a. Three month course that all elders and deacons. Amongst the church. Must participate in mandatory. <clears throat> right. To understand the judgment of the Most High. What's his expectations? So that we're not shepherds leading the sheep astray. Now, if we have all the, all the proper protocols according to the Most High in place, if these people or sheep or brothers and sisters decide to go off on their own and do certain things, we're absolved. Now, it's, it's in the Most High's hand. It's in his hands now. Right. But at least we are absolved from all these things. 
all the negative that might happen with them not hearing the counsel or hearing the spiritual counsel of the Most High, uh, we don't. We have nothing to do with it. And the example I can give, right? Because sometimes you have to put rules in place that can protect the tree, the sheep. So we say within the church, because within the church, we're not going to have it when people are coming in initially and just finding somebody that they want to sleep with and go and sleep with them. That there's going to be a time period within the church being guided by elders. It's going to be a time period. And from that time period, after that time period, right, three, six months or whatever it is, right, that time period is going to be a courtship where both of the families, the brother's family and the sister's family, are fully engaged in the whole three-month process or six-month process, right? Where it's the families bringing you together like it was in the Old Testament. And the elders making sure that they have a connection with both of the families instead of these two young people dealing with their lust, not realizing the, you know, the sin they're about to, to go into. And, you know, you know, we've we've even gotten pushback from that when we set that up. Oh, we forbidden to marry. Forbidden to marry is what the Catholic churches are doing with the priests and telling the priests they can't be a priest if they're married. Or a nun cannot be a nun and have a working in the church if they're married. That's forbidding to marry. We're saying that we're setting this up where people cannot bring their sin in to a relationship which is unfair to the person they're involved in with or they're looking to get involved with. That's fair. Why? Because usually people get all the bad news Later, they get in the relationship and then the person tells them everything. When the elders could have known certain things. You got baptized, the elders could have known some of the struggles and all that. So when the brothers and sisters came together before a consonant and say, well, I'm interested in this brother, I'm interested in this sister. Then it could have been full disclosure before witnesses. Well, listen, you know, you, you know, this is your struggle. Sister, you know this is your struggle, right? Now, do y'all know that this struggle's there, both of you? <laughs> did did, did y'all talk about this? Okay, now with that struggle, we have to make sure her father, her family, want to take on your struggle. We're not going to dishonor her father with this, okay? So we then call in the father. And say, sir, did you know he was interested in your daughter? <laughs> See, this is how a priest did it in the Old Testament. Not, no, I'm interested. Let's go out and have a good time. Let's talk. Oh, we linked up in the spirit. We're, we're soulmates. And now you come before the elders and say, well, we already slept together. You fornicated. You dishonored your father. The sisters dishonored her, her father. And, and you dishonored your family. The brother dishonored that sister's family. See, and the majority of the time this happens, when it happens, the relationship becomes toxic. It, it, it never works. And, if, and then sometimes children come from it. And then the elders are in perpetual councils after council with the same people. And they're only dealing with the disagreement that should have been solved before they came together. That usually be the core thing that causes a toxic relationship which ends in total separation. That's just some examples, right? There's, there could be other examples. You can have a, a straight up killer or murderer amongst you that, that, that confess and talk to elders and all that. But you have people, brothers and sisters, who love the feeling that comes with killing people. Now, you don't know that. You're just sitting and you're called to be saints. Sitting next to a person that, that that's grew up resolving all their issues through murder. But you don't know that. 
You know, just in the church and everyone is just saints and just lovely. You, 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 you think he's cute? On and on and on and on. You may have a sister that grew up and felt the only, only, the only time she's been accepted or felt any worth was when she gave her body to a man. See, she grew up feeling that this is the way you, you show your appreciation to a man who, who, who do think good things for you. You give your body over. And, and that became her normal way of operating in the earth. She think giving her body to anyone that's nice is, is charitable. And she could be just sitting up there in the church. See? So I'm putting these things out to say, listen, all of us, all of our sins together is, is as filthy rags before the most High. But if we're called to be saints for the kingdom of heaven, it comes a time where we have to become, we have to come a full age discerning good and evil, good from evil, and doing the right things for this kingdom to come. Right? <laughs> so I, I really believe that these shepherds in the Bible that, that the Most High was speaking about had good intentions when they gained their positions. When they were in position, when people were actually under them and learning from them. I have to believe that they gained the position, those positions based on righteous merit. <laughs> but something happened. Right? Let's go to 2nd Edris 7 and 70. We also are going to go into the annotated apocrypha. Right? To show you that righteous judgment must be set up and is getting set up in each of our churches. Let's go to Second Edra 7 and 70. Can you read, you can read it from there? Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> and this is from the annotated apocrypha. The, in the annotated, it also has the 70 scriptures. Right? It has the 70 scriptures that been that has been uh, that was hidden during the time of Ezra. The Most High said, "Well, I'm gonna give you this to publicize, and the rest you need to hide." Well, some of this information is the information that was hidden, but now revealed. Let's get Second Ezra seven and seventy. <clears throat> uh, Second Ezra chapter seven, verse seventy, from the annotated. Apocrypha? Yes. He answered me and said, When the Most High made the world and Adam and all who have came from him, he first prepared the judgment and the things that pertain to the judgment. So before Adam and Eve was made, right, were created, he already had the judgment, rights and wrongs, a place for judgment in place. See? From right from wrong, the place of haze where the souls would go if they were disobedient, all of that. Everything pertaining to judgment, righteous judgment, was established in the beginning, before man. Now, mind you, we are from the, the Most High. We're the image of the Most High. So some of his essence, his essence created us. So we are connected to him spiritually. So a lot of, lot of judgment, believe it or not, brothers and sisters, are organically sown, woven in, in, into our spiritual DNA, which means a lot of us know righteous judgment, but choose wrong. Because he created judgment from the beginning. That's part of it. Just like our father, Adam and Eve, they knew the right thing but chose the tree of good and evil. And I'm saying this is because usually when we do wrong, we usually, we usually try to, instead of admitting our wrong, we use an excuse to absolve it or claim it was a misunderstanding, hiding the sin. So we was going in with the elders and say, listen, 
we must recognize when this behavior is present. Right? When someone says it's a misunderstanding, they're hiding sin. When someone is making an excuse opposed to admitting to the sin, we know that sin. We have to get to the bottom of it and have them acknowledge the sin so that what? They can be healed and begin to, to come a, become a full age there. Right? Mm. But mind you, the Most High in the beginning created the spirit of judgment. And that's what people expect amongst saints. They come in as sheep feeling that, okay, I'm, there's no protection in the world. There should be a protection mechanism in this church for me. Right? Now, let's go to the book of James in your New Testament. So before he created man, the Most High created, prepared judgment in the things that pertains to judgment. <laughs> See that? So shepherds or those or leaders have to understand that. That we're going to be dealing with many matters amongst our people. Our people, are, all of us, have come out of a, a, a dark and evil and sinful world. So we're going to be dealing with those struggles. Right? They don't disappear. Like I said, there's no, there's no invisible thing that they walk through that, that have sin stay outside, right? That sin stays on the other side. It doesn't work that way. And brothers and sisters need to know, know that to protect themselves before they commit to certain relationships and all that with people. You must understand that you may be, this person is a stranger, but you got to know, okay, if they're here, they're here for sins <laughs> that they needed absolved. That they, that, they, that, they, that they needed the blood of Christ to heal them from. I need to figure out what that is. <laughs> right? I need to know what that is. And that's your barrier. They've already come in with, you know, a confessions of faults and, and sins being forgiven. So you've got to know, okay, is there, is there a sin there that disagrees in all sin? Disagrees with me, right? That's what you have to say. Well, listen, I have to know what that struggle was with that brother or sister. You know, I'm not being standoffish, but I'm not just going to jump into a relationship with this person not knowing what the struggle is. See? Because some of these struggles may be too hard for you to bear. That you may relate your, that, that you may get into. Right? Let's get the book of James 1 and 5. Uh, James chapter 1 and verse 5. Mm-hmm. If any of you lack wisdom, it says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of the Most High that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. And we was talking to the elders and said, well, and told them, well, listen, here's a scripture to let you know that in order to judge such a people, God's chosen people, we must receive something from the outside of us. And that's the wisdom of the Most High, the Holy Spirit. And that's the spirit that will help us judge righteous judgment. Not judging in partiality just because, uh, hey, you may know a person or you have a click with a person or this person you like. Oh, no, nah, all that have to be out of the door here. No, when it comes to judgment, there is no, there's no partiality. So first of all, before any judgment, counsels, whatever the case is, we must go to the Most High and pray for wisdom to judge his people righteously. Right? Now we're going into 2nd Ezra. 16th and 61. You have it? Mm -hmm. Read that. Uh, Second Ezra chapter 16 and verse 61. Come on. He made man and put his heart in the midst of the body. See that? He made man and put his heart in the midst of the body. Read. And gave him breath 
and gave him breath, life, life, and understanding. And what? Understanding. So the Most High did give man understanding. It's, it's woven, like I said, within our spiritual DNA, right from wrong. And I'm saying this so that we cannot no longer use excuses and become a full age so that we can acknowledge, acknowledge sin and rid ourselves of it. We can't use the, the gray areas anymore or the misunderstandings anymore because the Most High, Christ, don't work in gray areas. Satan does. Okay, all that, okay, um, well, there's a misunderstanding. No, I ain't no misunderstanding here. There's a sin here that must be acknowledged. Right? Because understanding right from wrong, we were created with the understanding of the Most High. So that means if a brother never read the Bible before, there would be within him the sense of right from wrong. So we must know that so that now people can't use an excuse without acknowledgement of a fault. See? Usually when sin is found, a person try to make an excuse for it. Oh, I thought you said this. Oh, no, I thought you said this and this is why I did that. Absolving themselves. Like, no, I know the most I put the understanding of right and wrong in you because he put it in all of us. Admit you chose wrong. Admit there was a, a decision there and you did what you wanted to do. We all we all have fallen victim to that within our lives. OK, but we must admit that these are the things that that gets us closer to that saint, the righteous one. Right. Uh, let's go to Ecclesiasticus in your Apocrypha. Mm -hmm. 15 and we're going to read 12 through 15. Uh, Ecclesiasticus or the book of Sirach, chapter 15 and verse 12. Yes. Say not thou, he hath caused me to err. See that? And that's another thing that all of us need to apply. You understand? In our everyday life, whether we operate within the church or with people without the church, we can never make excuses. The Bible says what? Read. Say not thou. Say not thou. He hath caused me to err. It's the most high that caused me to do this. This is what I thought the most high wanted me to do. Hmm. Yeah. Usually there's a thing where people, you know, like I was mentioning the other day. They'll do all these things and then say it was the will of the Most High. No, that was your will. Come on. For he have no need of the sinful man. He have no need of the sinful man. So we can't say after making our choices, it was the will of the Most High. No, that was your will. That was your will. So many times we try to cover ourselves by using the most high. He says, no, because the most high cannot tempt a man to do evil or wrong. No, you made that choice and you're using me as a scapegoat. Read verse 13. <clears throat> the Lord hateth all abomination and they that fear the most high love it not. He himself made man from the beginning and left him in the hand of his counsel. If thou wilt to keep the commandments and to perform acceptable faithfulness. See that? So the commandments that was given to Moses was the understanding given from the beginning. Not the death part, because don't forget, death came through what? Disobedience. See, and that's why Christ had to do away with the death part of the law given to Moses because in the beginning we just had the understanding of the law without death death came in with disobedience 
when Adam and Eve chose the tree of good and evil. And then it would make it now that any time we choose to do good, it's a choice. Right. Evil was present because why? Our mother and father made a choice when the understanding was already in them. They had the understanding. They had what was right, but chose wrong. So every child that is born of them, when they do right, it's, it's due to a choice. <laughs> right? That means everything in our lives comes with, well, should I do this or should, should I do that? When it shouldn't have been that way. That came in through our mother and father making the wrong choice. So now a choice is present. And those that choose life and right now, opposed to the tree of good and evil, will receive the tree of life again. See? But the point here, the foundation point here, is that understanding is put in all of us. Right from wrong is already known. Brothers and sisters know right from wrong before they come into a church. <laughs> right? We know that. Because they chose to come into a church. <laughs> so they knew there was sin present. See? They had understanding. What verse are you at there? That was 15. Okay. 15. Let's go to um, uh, 2 Timothy 3 and 16. You have it? Okay. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of the Most High. All scriptures are given by inspiration of the Most High. Right? And read. And is profitable for doctrine. So what is the Bible profitable for? So when people say, well, we shouldn't follow the Bible or the Bible is tampered with and all that. They're missing the key purpose for the Bible. All scripture is given by what? Inspiration of the Most High. Inspiration of the Most High. There's an overall spirit that's over these words. That's over the precepts. The Most High himself. Read. And is profitable for doctrine. So this how the Bible benefits us. It gives us the doctrine of the Most High. For reproof. It, it gives us the places for our own correction. Now check that out. You don't know whether or not you're doing right or wrong. If you don't know right from wrong given through the commandments of the Most High. So if you don't believe the Bible, it's the do as thou wilt law. That you're under. You choose right from wrong. But the Bible says if we trust in the Most High who've inspired these words, that He can give us what? He can allow us to read right from wrong so that we, as a as children of the Most High, we can now correct ourselves. Okay, I used to do this, but the law says that that, that the Most High God. Is not with this. So I'm going to correct myself. I'm not going to do this because the Most High said it's wrong. Right? There's no man judging you. This is you judging yourself. <laughs> right? You're getting right with the Most High. Right? Come on. Reproof, correction. Come on. For correction. For correction. For instruction in righteousness. For instruction in righteousness. Why? But because before the church, before the work, we were being instructed by the, the, the course of this world. The principalities, the powers of the air. By, by Satan. Right? Come on. Uh, 16, 17. 17 also. That the man of the most high may be perfect so that the man and woman of the most high may be perfect right 
Come on. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Mm. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And that's the purpose of the Bible. For reproof. For correction. Right? Let's go to Romans 7 and 21. Let's go. Uh, Romans chapter 7 and verse 21. Go on. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Paul says he find it for law, like I've mentioned, er, mentioned earlier. That when we, when usually when we do the good thing, the right thing, and it's, I, I bless the most high that we choose right. Mm -hmm. But all in all, it's a shame that there's a choice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Paul said he's seen that when he chose right, evil was present. Why? Because he had to make a choice. He could have chose wrong. So evil was there. So there's something still working in us that makes evil or choosing evil a viable choice. Mm. See? And a lot of us like to, some of us would like to ignore that. We think that when we're baptized or when we're in the church or we're operating with the body, we begin to think that that evil thought Lie, it stays on the outside of us. Hmm. We tend to believe we're baptized. Now that evil thought went someplace else. Don't we, we can't deceive ourselves. We have to always be knowledgeable of that same spirit. It's there. Now through the Holy Spirit, you can buffet that spirit. You can understand when it's trying to rise and do things to keep it at bay. But it will, it will be there until the coming of our Lord and Savior. We all must acknowledge and understand that. That wrong choice is always there. Right? So, in a real life setting, in, in an example, because I was dealing with it from an elder standpoint on how to deal with these certain issues mm -hmm. and counsel when someone is coming with that type of behavior, how to answer it and heal the person back and restore them into, you know, on the path of Christ. But let me give an example of us, just regular old people, the regular brothers and sisters operating in the church who's dealing with these decisions now. Hmm. Right? Man. A sister. Man, I really like. Uh, I really like that brother. It seemed like he got a good spirit. Da, da 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 right? I'm using relationships as an example because I, people can relate to that. I really like this brother, whatever the case is. You know, I, I see him looking at me, whatever the case is. You know, you know how his normal thing is. So, she don't just link in like that and just exchange numbers. What she do is she, she go before the elders and go for an elder in council and say, well, listen, you know, uh, I'm kind of interested in somebody this brother, it seems like, you know, maybe something else going on there. How do I go about this? Right? Mm -hmm. That's the proper way to do it. How do I go about this? Because we have been entrusted as shepherds in the church to say, you know, help. Like it's Sometimes it's all good. But I hope maybe that's deep because this brother been working. He been doing what was right. He been operating in the spirit of the most high. And for years, he'd been thinking about having a woman, but he wanted a righteous sister. Right? So it'd be like, well, sister, you know what? I'll tell you what. Um, well, the brother is single. I mean, if you want, we can set up a meeting. And if y'all are interested, we can bring y'all families involved. You know, you can bring your, because what? We, we're not, the family's going to do this. And see, and that's one thing about the church. The church and the people of the church has an extended family. And we look to make sure that the family agrees with what's going on. Why? They already have, to some degree, a preconceived notion that's put out there that those that are following the truth is in a cult. So this is the way that we can show family out there 
that we are actually instilling the wisdom and counsel of the Most High and care for their children like they care for their children. That's the perfect way. You want to know how you can get your family involved and find the truth and, and all that? Well, that's a perfect example. Instead of people just running around, sleeping around and trying to find each other on their own and secretly in the dark sneaking around, the family will respect the fact that elders called them and said, well, your daughter's interested in this brother or this brother's interested in this sister. Can we all come together because we would like to do this righteously like it was done during crisis time? When he turned that ward into wine, that was a righteous marriage. Right? We want to do this right like Christ would have. And we don't want you to think that there's something secret going on that you don't know about, something you might not disagree with. And we need your opinion. Because why? You have nurtured your daughter. You understand her needs and what she wants. And you have to tell him what's expected for your daughter. Because you know what your daughter likes. You know your daughter's dislikes. So you need to tell this man if he's willing to step up to do these things that's expected for your princess. For your queen. Right? Because why? If something happened wrong to the sister, who's going to be blamed? No one is even going to be thinking about him. It's going to be all the church. The elders didn't do this. The brothers, it's going to be the, the stain is going to be on the church itself. But if we do this right, now family's going to say, man, I didn't know y'all do things like this in the church. In respect, y'all didn't even know me and had enough respect to honor my position as a mother and father with my daughter. Because all the problems that come with her marrying this guy, these problems, the family have to take that on. She's going to be crying to the family. See? So I'm giving you some, some, some real-time examples that if we put things in place, just, just how we interact with those that are without will open the door for them to come through and find out what this truth is. What we're really teaching, what, what this church is all about. Right? Let's go to, um, real quick, Shapat. Revelations 3, 15 and 16. <clears throat> yes. Uh, Revelations chapter 3 and verse 15. Yes. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. Now, this was Christ speaking to the church. See? He told the church, um, one moment here. Where you at? Yeah. yeah. This was the church of Lacedonia. Right? right? The, the, no, no. The church, the church of the, the, the Lodicians. Right. The church of the the Laodiceans. He says, I know your works that ye are neither hot or cold. Now, and he's speaking to the elders of the church here. How the elders of the church are not judging righteous judgment. They everything is in the middle. Right. They can't make a defined decision on nothing. Everything is just lukewarm. So they're not judging righteous judgment there. This is the church in Revelations. Right? Now, what Christ did with the seven churches in Revelations shown to John was showing all the spirit of his church at the very end. How each of these churches had attributes right that all that, that Christ's church would be for the kingdom. And what to correct in all the churches before Christ returns. So that's what the seven churches represents uh, in the book of Revelations. The Jewish people who followed the old covenant, they have the menorah. Those Israelites who are in Christ have the seven churches. That's our candlestick for correction, to know right from wrong, setting Christ's path for, for his kingdom. The lights of the menorah are the seven churches. It's not the physical menorah anymore. Right. So he's now correcting the church of, of the Laodiceans. Read. 
uh, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. Yes. I would that thou wert cold or hot. He says, I wish that you were cold or hot. I wish that you as a church could make decisions and stand with your decisions instead of being in the middle of everything and not being able to judge righteous judgment. Read. Verse 16. So then, because thou art lukewarm. Because you can't make decisions and judge righteous judgment. Read. And neither cold nor hot. Read. I will spew thee out of my mouth. I will spew thee out of my mouth. That's Christ speaking to what? The churches. Like if you cannot make a decision on anything and stand on anything, I'm going to destroy all your works. Okay, I'm going to destroy that church. And see, and that's why churches throughout the earth are being destroyed right now. Because they don't stand on anything. They're neither hot nor cold. They'll accept any sin within their four walls and absolve it through the blood of Christ and say, well, Christ, forgive your sins, even though you're, you're still a perpetual evil sinner without righteous judgment on this earth, without proper leadership that would guide you out of your sin. They are, they are excusing sin. And that's why, according to Christ's command, he's destroying all the churches in the earth today. They need the hot or cold. They allow people to stay perpetual sinners without repentance. And that don't apply to just them. That applies to anyone who's called under, under the banner of Christ. So if you are an Israelite that's following or an Israelite church that operated in Christ, these rules apply. Because the original churches were Israelite churches under Christ. The church he's, he's speaking to and warning here. Is a church under Christ. Come on. Uh, verse 17. Yeah. <clears throat> because thou sayest I am rich. And increased with goods. Because thou sayest. I'm rich. And increased with goods. That's your prosperity gospel. They, they are excusing all sin. Not judging right. Why? Because they would rather the sinners be in there to do what? To bolster the numbers for finances. That's the prosperity churches. That's why they're not judging righteous judgment. Because they want the numbers that comes with sinners being there. Now the sinners are really there to do what? Initially they come there to get what? Help. For their sin. But you will see a shepherd that's over the church and look at it and say, well, listen, no, you I'm, I'm going to sever you separate. And, you know, the same judgment don't fall on you because you got something. I need your money so you can still do some of that stuff. But just don't tell everybody else. Don't tell no one else that, you know, now you get the front pews, you get the front seats and all that because you got money instead of. A righteous judge, judge saying, well, listen, I don't care how much you have. OK, you can sit there amongst everyone else and you, you got to show right in the body of Christ, because I'm not going to to make haste to give you a certain position strictly based on your world status. See, that's judging righteous judgment. So when people come to me and be like, well, I got this and I got that and all that. And I look them straight in the eyes and brothers will tell you, anyone who come to me like that, they'll tell you, I tell, I tell them, excuse me, I'm really not interested in what you have. I'm interested in what you're going to do because all the, there's not going to be any money soon. What, what, what riches are you working to store for the kingdom of heaven? Are you willing to get in the muck like us and do this work? Because I don't, you know, what you have. Is not going to give you a, a separate status here. I've been without. I've been with. I understand what the love of money is. I understand what 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 uh, 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 money as a defense is. I understand all the scriptures concerning money. You don't get extra status and get your sins absolved because you have some money in the world. Okay. And I'm going to tell you, there's people that that's within our church. You know what I mean. 
who, you know, who, who, who are basketball players and their family are basketball players and all that. And if you talk to them, they tell you, we've never asked them for anything. Not once. I don't have no special Rolodex for the rich people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I need, they need to learn for the kingdom of heaven. That's all that we need. You understand? <laughs> but you had the church of Lacedonia. I mean, Lodosians who were actually making, you know, making partial judgment for those who had status. See? Come on. Because thou sayest I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing. Go on. And knowest not that thou art wretched. Don't you know you're wretched? And miserable. And miserable. That's what Christ says. You're wretched and miserable. Read. And poor. And poor. Wow. Poor in spirit. When you see these people flossing with the jets and the cars and all that, that's just a front to hide their wretched spirit. That's what it is. It's all a front. They're wretched. They're poor. They're spiritually poor. And they're trying to cover that with things. See that? And that's why we had to also show the elders, listen, we ain't not going to have nowhere in the church where someone is being treated special in one of these churches because they have come in with something. They may have seen us in a video or something. And they, we send them to you to be guided and you're checking out what they got. And now there's a certain status they have with that. I don't need no special report from a church or something saying, well, guess who just walked through the doors? He just came in and he, I don't want no reports on those special people. Christ is a special one. OK, so we're not going to show partiality if, because many people are going to come to the truth, regardless of status, rich, poor, otherwise. We are to judge everyone equally. We are to operate with everyone equally. And I'm just touching on some points we we discussed amongst Elders, deacons, leaders, those that are, are called to be leaders within the church. Right? All right. Um, let's get straight to it. Let's see. Let's get straight to it. All right. Is, is so many good things. I'm sorry I can't touch on everything. Um, let's go into, let's read real quick. Um, because what happens is in all, like I said, there's a choice between right or wrong. Usually, temptation or something we desire or want may lead to our decisions. A lot of us don't want to admit that. We'll say it's the will of the Most High, but really, it's something we would like to do that leads to our decisions, right? And we'll try to use that and excuse that part, right? When it comes to admitting why we did certain things. <laughs> we'll excuse, well, this, this was my interest. I had a special interest in doing this because I wanted something out of this. We'll always say, oh, no, well, the most I got me that way or this is what I thought y'all were talking about and I did that. But they'll never say the key reason, the key spirit, what they wanted out of things. And I say, elders, we have to come to a point where we can weed through the muck and point out and find the root of those decisions so that they can admit it's there and not operate amongst the body going forward with that type of that type of spirit right the worst thing that can happen is a man is, is dealing with his own lust or sin man or woman and then they try to use the most high as a cover for it I'm doing it because this is what I thought the most high wanted me to do Right. Let's go to Jeremiah 17, 
9 and 10. There's a lot of good caveats. I don't mean to be fragmented, but there's so many different points. I just want to make sure that you get some of the points we touched on in our private meetings. Right? <clears throat> Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10 real quick. Uh, the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17 and verse 9. Read. The heart is deceitful above all things. The heart is deceitful above all things. And desperately wicked. And desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can know the heart of man? Now, before you read the next part, keep in mind, in the beginning, the Most High instilled understanding in our hearts. See? But after our mother and father, our father and mother sinned and chose the tree of good and evil, something else came into our heart that fights against that understanding. And if we choose that, we choose what? The repercussion of that, which is what? Death. The consequences of that, excuse me, which is death. See? If you choose wrong, the wages of sin is death. So we have that understanding heart that was made with us that links us back to the law when we hear it because we were with Christ in the beginning. We are the sons of Adam who had that heart before the fall. See? So that, that struggle that we have is the same thing that happened with Adam and Eve, the same thing that happened with all the children who came from them, right? We have to acknowledge there's a wicked heart in us. We can't ignore that. So when you make a decision and you start to say, well, I thought that that's the problem. You didn't lean on the counsel of the most high. You didn't lean on the commandment of the most high. So that tells us that, that that's showing that there's something else that's guiding you. That's adverse to the spirit of understanding. You must acknowledge that or you're going to continue to operate in that same mindset. Right. Read the next verse. Verse 10. I, the Most High, search the heart. The Most High searches the heart. I try the reins. He tried the reins. Even to give every man according to his ways. Even to give every man according to his ways. To show you that man has will. The Most High gave man free will. So you can chart your own path within the Most High's measure of time. He had a path from the beginning that was just life. When man chose death, that was showing within the Most High's measure of time, man can chart his own course. Now, if he go on the righteous course and choose the understanding that was there from the beginning, he gets the kingdom. She gets the kingdom. See? But through this measure the Most High gave us called time, he gave man free will within it, where they can chart their own course. So no man anywhere can say that they're choosing and what they're doing is the will of the Most High. The, the Most High already have his will. It's written. No, that's your will. And we, as children of the Most High, have to decipher between the two. We have to know when it's the Most High's will, and our personal lust and temptation that's guiding us down the wrong path. Hmm. See? That's another thing. Instead of us admitting what's going on when sin is found, we try to say, well, it was the will of the Most High. Well, no, I read the real will of the Most High. This, this is the will of the Most High. What you're doing is you. You're trying to use the most high to cover your sin like our father and mother use fig leaves to cover their sin in the garden. It doesn't work that way. You can't cover yourself. In order to be whole and to be free of that darkness that comes with hiding, you must let it go. You must admit this is you so that you can go to the next stage in this. You must, you must be able to know yourself. Even your shortcomings. And acknowledge it. See? So as elders, we have to understand, like I said, as, as deacons, and we know what's going on if, 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 if it's happening. We have to be careful not to blame the person 
but have them come to the acknowledgement of that thing that's operating. Because they'll connect themselves with the spirit and feel you are attacking them. That's what, that's what the spirit wants. The evil spirit that's trying to drag someone down want that person to get defensive. So it can protect itself and take the little demon back out with him. So we have to be careful with this and understand when we're pointing out sin or trying to get the person to acknowledge their own sin so that they can judge themselves that these people don't feel they're being attacked because it's not them. They're not the problem. It's the spirit, that thing that, that, they, that they were baptized to try to cleanse that's trying to pull them back. See? So, again, when it comes to decision making, all of us understand that temptation has a place in our decisions and that that has nothing to do with the most high. Right. Somebody may have their personal issues they're dealing with and they try to merge that with the will of the most high for their own gain. An example I can give you just out outright. You have a person who's looking and saying, well, listen, right now and I'm hurting right now financially. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to come in. I'm amongst the church. And what I'll do is, you know, I'll come up with some enterprise within the church. <laughs> And say, I'm just doing it so I can spread the word of the most high so that everybody can get it. When really, you're doing it to invest in a business within the church so that you can be taken care of. <laughs> you understand? Without proper oversight and right protocol. <laughs> right? But you will say, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about this thing so that we can spread the word. But in your heart, you're thinking about the rent you need to get paid. Or th you understand? So it was that that drove you. Even though it may, it may be across the board or be presented as good intentions to spread the word. Let me tell you, hey, we're just putting it out there to say, listen, sometimes your heart and what you're dealing with goes into your decisions. And you must realize that. So you have to be able to do the work and do certain things without your own intentions as the drive, driving force for it. Right? Because then it would eventually it would it's gonna taint the whole thing. It's gonna destroy the whole thing. Right? Now, like I was mentioning earlier, some of the hard things to do, the toughest thing that Satan works, works when it comes within a person is, is to not allow any of us who are dealing with issues to take personal accountability for it. Right? Satan don't want you to take accountability for it because you are acknowledging the spirit or the sin. So taking accountability is a key point for all those on, on the path to Christ. So I was mentioning to the elders, we have to make sure there's accountability on every area. Even if we're wrong in a situation, in a council, we must take accountability for our wrong. Period. And if we are wrong in a situation, and we know we're wrong in a situation that 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 absolves us from judging that matter. We have to have another elder that's clean from it all that can judge a matter because it's impossible for an, an impartial judge to give what? No, it's, it's impossible for a partial judge to give impartial judgment. So if you've got a problem with a person and you have already stained that relationship to some degree, how can that person trust you for judgment? So they got to be some accountability there. So if they know that you admit you're wrong, then they can now come to you for judgment. Right. <laughs> but when it comes to that, that initial counsel, 
If you've already been impartial, I mean, if you've already been partial or wrong, you can't judge a matter. We have to have other judges and counselors within the church that can judge a matter on the outside of you. And it doesn't compromise your position at all. <laughs> you understand? You set that up. You set up the righteous judgment for that person. Hmm. Until the trust factor is there. And, and, and then, you know, eventually you will judge matters because they know that you are not a partial judge. Right? So these are other mechanisms we're setting up in, 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 in the, uh, the church. But all in all, outside of the elders, when it comes to counseling, we must, we, we must, a brother or sister must understand the power of accountability. The healing process that comes with one being accountable for, for themselves. Be it right or wrong. If they're wrong, they should just say straight out, listen, I'm wrong. This is my sin according to the law. I'm not trying to hide it. I want to be free from it. Yeah, I did wrong. And what's going to happen? The brothers and sisters are going to embrace you. And say, listen, don't beat yourself down. Don't worry about it. It's, it you know, dealing with your accountability wasn't as, as bad as you thought it was going to be, is it? Was it? Satan tried to make you believe that People were going to reject you or hate you and all that. <laughs> right? But there's power in being accountable. Right? Let's go there real quick. Um, the need. Now, let, let, let's go to Genesis 3, 11 through 13. Matter of fact, let me go right to it, the answers to it. Go to Matthew 7, 1 through 5. Right? And we're going to end it here, but next week I'm going to go into the power of wisdom. And understanding. The power of wisdom and understanding according to the Most High. Right? I'm going to go into that next Sabbath. Let's read Matthew 7, 1 through 5. Uh, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1. Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Now, what is Christ telling the Pharisees and scribes to judge, lest ye not be judged? Keep in mind, you cannot have a church without equitable judgment. But what Christ is who's Christ is speaking to is unrighteous judges. Judges who are operating for their own terms like the Pharisees and scribes. Don't you know if you judge unrighteously that what goes around comes around? And when you're under the same, when, when you're looking for the same mercy, someone is going to judge you that way? See? <laughs> he says, you're judging unrighteously. You cannot have a working without righteous judgment. But you had the Pharisees and scribes dragging people up and making mockery of them before Christ and saying, we found her in the sin of, of, of adultery. Stone her. And he says, ye without sin cast the first stone. Why? Because if Christ had to cast stones, all the guys that were dragging her up would have been killed too. They slept with her. See? See? So we have to start judging righteous judgment. So when Christ says, judge lest ye be judged, judge not, is speaking of unrighteous judges who would take their position as leaders and use it as a weapon of authority, of, of tyranny against their own people. That cannot be seen among saints. Having a position and now you're using it 
at, at some type of punishment against people like the Pharisees and scribes. Read verse three. <clears throat> yes. And why beholdest thou, excuse me, and why beholdest thou thy, the mote that is in thy brother's eye? See, now Christ is making it clear here. You're dealing with the mote in your brother's eye. Read. But considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye. But look at what's going on with you. How can you be judging a matter when you're doing the same or has done even worse? Right? So you have to be careful how you judge. Now, on a layman's uh, perspective, they're just talking about someone, looking at someone else, talking about someone else, always trying to down someone as if they're better when they do worse. Hmm. But there's also a judge's perspective. Okay? When you're judging matters in counsel. Right? Judge not, lest you be judged. Okay? So when we're judging, we're restoring one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself. Considering ourselves, lest we also be tempted. We're not looking at a situation like, man, look at how su sullen and, and dirty and red you are compared to my cleanliness. No, it doesn't work that way. We're restoring, we have to restore people, not judge them and make them feel less than nothing th through a fault or a mistake. And then if they know that's the proper judgment of the Most High, Brothers and sisters will be willing to come through and talk openly and righteously, you know, concerning, you know, you know, what's ailing them spiritually, because they know it's a righteous judgment that's coming. And they know that only, you know, they know that those that are in, that have been entrusted with operating with them and help guiding them have their best interest spiritually. At heart, they'll see that. See? And sometimes you have to read these scriptures and go through this so that people will know that this type of righteous judgment exists. So they'll know that exists amongst us. Right? Come on. Verse 4. <clears throat> or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out thy mote out of thine eye. Let me help you get corrected. What verse you at there? Verse 4. Come on. And behold, a beam is in thine own eye. And yet you doing wrong the same thing. How can you judge a matter when you're doing even worse? Shouldn't you use the same judgment and counsel that you're given for yourself? First. <laughs> right? Read the fifth verse. Verse 5. Thou hypocrite, mm. first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. So those that are in position of correcting and all that must make sure there's no tree hanging out of the side of their head first before looking to try to point out and coming down on someone else for their shortcomings. Because we've all have sinned and come short of the glory of the Most High. Okay, we're all working for this same prize. And if we set up righteous judgment amongst the church, then those that grow in time will be grown into full grown spiritual counselors within their own right. That's what we're looking to build here, a nation of kings and priests. Okay, and that we're setting things up with judgment amongst us. Because Paul even said, don't you know that we, that the Most High is going to use you to judge angels? Hmm. See that? Because why? Enoch was used to judge angels before the flood. We, we are set up for that same judgment who are in Christ. So we must learn the power of righteous judgment to discern good from evil and choose the right path for that particular position. And if we can't judge matters amongst ourselves, how, how are we going to be able to judge the weightier matters upon the coming of our Lord and Savior? Right? Mm -hmm. Last scripture. Let's get Romans 2 and 1. 
<clears throat> yes. Romans chapter 2 and verse 1. Yes. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. See that? You are inexcusable, thou man, whoever those that judge. These are the same unrighteous judgment, uh, judge, judges Christ was speaking to and talking about. That means brothers and sisters that do go through things shouldn't feel that they're being abused or looked upon as anything different if they come with what they're dealing with. Oh, you know, to cleanse, even if they make a, an egregious mistake. They can be forgiven. Okay. Read on. Therefore, thou now, art... Now, now, of course, let me, make, let, me, let me put this out there, though. Mm -hmm. The scriptures tell you that if, it, if they continue to do that without, you know, and continue to do the same thing over and over, right. then, then that's when the repercussion comes, the final judgment on a matter. But all in all, we're restoring one in, 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 the, uh, in the spirit of meekness in hopes that they see their fault. And acknowledge their fault and put it away forever. That's the point. That's the end game. Now, now they come. Now, now they have achieved the next level in this work on Christ's path of overcoming themselves and acknowledging the sin that was, you know, that was dragging them, that was holding them and, and weighing on them. Right. Mm -hmm. Read on. Whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another... What verse are you at there? Uh, the middle of verse 1. Go on. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. So he said you're judging another and condemning yourself. Because you're judging someone for something you know you've struggled with yourself. Coming down on them. How can you do this? That, that, who are you? Like, like, how can you be like that? Who are you? Suppose Christ judged us like that. According to, according to the word, according to the law, all of us should be dead. Okay, and Christ had mercy on us to the point where he put sinners in position, positions on this earth after being cleansed as judges again. That's how merciful he is for us, to us. That unworthy people can now judge righteously. See? So now how can we get, get so clean to the point where we're going to come down on our brothers and sisters, you know, for what they've, they've, they've done wrong? To the point where it'll move them out, and, and, and out into the world and get destroyed by the spirit that began all this. See? Verse. Uh, I need you to go to the... Uh, uh, the 21st verse. You, you, you had the second verse yet? Uh, finish in verse 1. Yeah. For thou that judgest doest the same things. Mm. Come on. Uh, verse 2 or 21. 2. Verse 2. But we are sure that the judgment of the Most High is according to truth. We are sure that the judgment of the Most High is according to truth. Against them which commit such things. Against them which commit such things. See? Go down to the 21st verse. Mm -hmm. uh, Romans 2 and 21. Thou therefore which teachest another. If we teach another. Teachest thou not thyself? Do we not teach ourselves? Speaking of judges. Read. Thou that preachest a man should not steal. Read. Dost thou steal? Are you stealing while telling other people that coming down on somebody for stealing? Read. Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Are you teaching that, the, that thou should not commit adultery in the law, but yet you are practicing adultery? You're dealing with adultery right now, but yet you're judging, man, brother, how can you do that? Sister, mm -hmm. how can you do that? Now, this is what was going on during the time of Christ with the Pharisees and scribes. They were in judges' seats, paid by the Roman Empire. They was like our modern-day politicians, the Sanhedrin and all that, the, the Pharisees. They were doing all types of wickedness 
amongst the Romans too. A lot of them. And then, but they were judging matters and throwing people in jail and all that and killing people and all that according to the Judaic law. The same way today. We got all these criminals in City Hall doing all types of wickedness, but yet when, you know, early in the morning they set up as judges and throwing people in court, giving them the death penalty and all that on a regular basis. And these are wicked people in city council and uh, that are judges. Mm. The pedophiles and all that are judging people for death in hell, for death, jail and all that. Same thing that was going on back during Paul's time. Don't forget the Sanhedrin was under Roman rule, a bunch of freaks and perverts. So he said, how can y'all judge? They were like, well, this is what the books say. This is on the books. All right. That's what the laws say. We got to execute what the law said, even though they're not doing it themselves. But we can't be found like that. We judge with mercy. We understand if someone is dealing with an illness or dealing with whatever, the, a sickness, which is a spiritual illness, that that thing need healing. They don't need to be attacked or or or. They don't need to feel less than any of their brothers and sisters because they're struggling with sin. Right? Mm -hmm. Come on. <clears throat> the middle of verse 22. Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law, dishonorest thou the Most High? For the name of the Most High is blasphemed among the Gentiles mm. through you as it is written. Yeah, it says it's blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written. The Gentiles knowing, because don't forget, the Gentiles also have the spirit of understanding that came through Adam. And they're looking to taint and minimize the spirit of truth that's coming through Israel today. So they'll point out wrong and all that. They'll point out unrighteous judgment that can be proven them as correct concerning the law they that we claim to be upholding. See? Paul was even speaking of this. So, like I was saying, tell, telling the elders and talking with the elders with, you know, very, very good conversation, very good class being had with the leadership course. It's like, listen, it doesn't matter um, what happened in the past or before. Okay, this church started off with me and another, uh, a few other brothers just on the corner talking and we had no idea that the Most High would make it where thousands of people would begin to learn and come to the knowledge of the truth. But through that comes a responsibility of setting up a proper order of leadership and counsel amongst the body now. Okay? We, we have to have a, a construct according to the spirit, okay, to, to manage the work of the Most High and to make sure these people who come in get righteous judgment and remain and through our teachings become righteous judges themselves. Okay? Doesn't matter how we got here, we're here now. Okay, so this is the responsibility or we become the shepherds that scattered the Most High's flock. And no one wants to be that. Okay, so we're doing the best we can. We're working hard, putting certain structures in place, righteous structures so that the Most High can, can, can really, you know, bless the works of our hands here on this earth for him. You understand? And I, I believe that this is for an entirely different reason outside of what we're thinking right now. I believe that the Most High is setting up a leadership structure amongst ourselves that will lead to the wilderness. I truly do. And the relationships we develop now and how we constantly deal with each other now is how we will be in that place. So I'm going to go into the the spirit of wisdom and understanding and counseling next Sabbath. You understand? And of course, there, there's a lot of different uh, teachings that are normally out there that seems, you know, that's more clickbait 
than anything else. But it's classes like this, brothers and sisters, is why we were called. Okay. Us being Israel, and I'm an Israelite. I, listen, I love the heritage, the heritage of, our, of my forefather, Abraham. I love, I, I love the stories that come with how we, how we went out of Egypt and the, our God, the highest, saved us, revealed his name to Moses. I love the stories of, of how the Amorites and all the, all the uh, Nephilim nations were destroyed and the Canaanite nations were destroyed under the hands of, of, of Joshua and Caleb, Moses. I love those stories, how we got the land against all odds, our forefathers. The stories of even though we went into captivity, the Most High began to bring that light as was promised and begin to restore it in our minds that we are the true children of Israel. I love all of that. Okay, I'm an Israelite. But we must follow and adhere to the Israelite, which is Christ, and his church that was set up in the New Testament. Okay, and guess what? I understand that even though I'm an Israelite in the flesh, that's not going to get me the kingdom of heaven. You understand? There's many people, many are called, few are chosen. You being an Israelite is good, but with that comes a higher responsibility knowing now the law. And then you have to understand the law in Christ for this kingdom. So all of that stuff out there, the different things, when you, the white man coming up, the, the signs, Cedric Bougier, all that stuff is it's okay. It's good stuff. It's not for the kingdom of heaven. The most high established from the beginning a judgment before man was created. We must align ourselves with that judgment. Hence, through the spirit of the Most High, the gathering of Christ's church. Shalom. And I'll answer all your questions in one moment. And keep in mind, brothers and sisters, get into that Hebrew and Bible Academy, okay? Because a lot of information is not like it was before. Through your help, through the brothers and sisters who have helped us with this in the past, it has become something on an entirely different level. Even those that were in it before come and say, well, hold up. This is something different because the most high Holy Spirit is is upon the church and is operating and bringing forth knowledge and understanding for these times. And we've implemented that on a weekly basis with our lessons for the Hebrew and Bible Academy and the real time news with Shapat is irreplaceable. There's no news like this anywhere in the earth. OK, so. Uh, you, you have to be there. And I'm, I'm saying that because it also helps the work beyond that. And not only will it give you some key information, it's your way of really showing an, an appreciation on your side to say, you know what, let me help the work. We don't, we don't have no prosperity gospel going on where people are sowing seed for a word. But, but what we're giving and having our administration work around the clock to make sure this thing work from week to week. You understand? It's costly. And what you but what you receive is, is you know, you can't put a price on it. And but what we receive in in, in your carnal things, such as the, the finances that come through, really helps sustain the work and allow us to do more of what you're actually seeing. So with that, I'm going to say Shalom and uh Thank you, brothers and sisters, for your participation on the Sabbath. And I hope through the spirit of the Most High, you've received uh, uh, some serious spiritual food today on, on the Lord's Sabbath. Shalom. And hold tight for the Q&A's. All right. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, I'll, I'll only take a few more moments, answer a few questions, and then we'll wish you all Godspeed. And for those that are in the academy, we'll see you uh, early in the morning with Elder Lawyer. And then, of course, myself and Chapala come on with the news. Have you went in, into anything yet? Or? Uh, just research right now. Research? Okay. Well, I'm sure it's going to be uh, interesting. <laughs> all right. Let me open up the chat here. 
Shalom, the chat is now opened. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, this is uh, Jack Shadar on GOCC website under clean and unclean foods. It says mackerel is clean fish. Okay, but Elder Gaja has a video showing how mackerel do not have scales and are unclean. Okay, I have to speak to Gaja to see what he has up there. All right. Because once I speak with him, that will uh, clear that up. And if he's incorrect, he'll take that down. Okay. And that will, that will absolve all conflict there. All right. Because what we have on the site is correct. So what I'll do is I'll speak to him to take that particular video down until it's cleared up. And then if what he's showing is correct, then we'll put it up on the website and he can republish that particular video. That's how it's going to go. Because we can't have no confusion out there. All right. OK. Brother Tony, but you can follow what we have on the site. OK. You can follow what we have on the site. OK, so we'll correct that amongst ourselves and he'll take that down. And if he can show what it is, that's my brother. You understand? Good man, great man, great teacher of this work. Right. And if he can, if he show that to us, then we'll comply and change it. But otherwise, we're going to keep things as is. Uh, brother Tony. Uh, Shalom, uh, Elder Ricard. The water of the recording, Brother Shapat, good lesson. Uh, praise the Most High. The water to you. Bless you. Yafar Kadar Zion. Shalom, elders. Who are the Obedadam and what tribe? I looked online and it says Obedadam are worshippers of Edom. Second Chronicles 9 and 2. Who are net net themes, uh, the tribe and their functions? Please clarify. Okay, read Chronicles thirteen. First Chronicles. First Chronicles thirteen and four. Well, let me get it here. Is it is it First Chronicles? That's one part of that question. Yeah. Well, let's get the first one. First Chronicles thirteen and fourteen, right? Oh, is it fourteen or fourteen? Yeah, thirteen and fourteen. Okay, there you go. Yeah. And the Ark of the Most High remained with the family of Obedidam in his house three months, and the Most High blessed the no, house. No, First Chronicles thirteen and thirteen. You had 14. Yeah, I'm at 14. 13 and 13. Uh, so David brought not the ark home to himself to the city of David, but carried it aside into the house of Obededon, the Git Gittite. Okay, the Gittite. These are families of Nephilim. Don't forget, Edom also himself gave him operated in sleeping with Adah, one of the daughters of Nephilim. So these families do connect to th those particulars, the Edomites who linked with the Nephilim families. Okay? So both are correct in your study. Okay? And we can go later, well, we deal with that, we're going to deal with that in the academy when it comes to the tracing the serpent seeds and the Nephilim. We're going to go into the different families of the, of the ites in a future lesson. 
Okay, pool 11. So go to Genesis 36, and you'll be able to trace when Esau, Edom, one of his sons linked up with Adah, which was a, uh, a Nephilim seed, a Canaanite daughter, and they bore children like Horites. And these are these that's the bloodline now that's over the families of the earth, like the Queen of England, the Jewish people. And that's why the Jewish people tend to say that the bloodline is through the mother's side, believing that the Canaanite side was more celestial, mm. being children of people slash angels. Mm. Nephilim. So they'll say that the mother must be Jewish in order for you to be Jewish, given more you know, acknowledgement and credence to the Nephilim side that happened with Esau dealing with Adah, the daughter of a Canaanite. Right? Let's see here. Um, but not all, let me make it clear, not all of Edom's children are that. So you read Genesis 36, there were children where, where he, where he uh, slept with Ishmael and bore children. Those Edomites are not the Nephilim bloodline, okay? So there's different families of Edom. The mistake most people make out there is trying to put all white people under the same, you know, judgment and against white people and all that being Edom, not understanding the difference between them, right? Okay. I can't answer all your questions, Jacques Chadar, because that, that'll be disrespectful to those who who didn't get their questions answered. Right? Shalom elders, happy Sabbath. Is there a way to contact you or reach out? I would like to discuss a personal matter concerning today's lesson, if that's okay. Well, Queen Sophia, that is okay. What I would like for you to do real quick, why don't you send me a message right now? You see where it says gathering of Christ? Why don't you send me a private message with your phone number and we'll call you. So you can private message gathering of Christ right here through the chat. And so what what will happen is I'll see your name, which is Queen Sophia, and get the message you have for me personally. Under a private message. You see her there? But Q should be appearing. Queen Sophia. So send me a private message real quick, Sophia. Send the private message. I, I have you here. Nothing. Better yet, Queen Sophia. Because something is going on where the private messages are not coming up here. Put your phone number in the chat. I'll grab it real quick, then delete it. Put it in the, the regular chat right here like you did before. I'll grab the number real quick and delete it afterwards. Waiting on you, Queen Sophia. If you want your questions answered, or you need a call, I need that information now, or I'm gonna have to go on, go forward. Okay.
All right, thank you. A friend of mine is having a hard time believing in the Most High. He asked me, why do we live, why, why do we live in a fallen world? The sin of Adam is why we live in a fallen world. And man was made within that world to create the world to come. You understand? So creation is being done again. Those that choose the right path will get the world that he, that he feels we should have. Okay, now we must work towards that kingdom instead of it's just being given to us. Um, let's see here. Um, it stumped me a bit, so I wanted to hear your thoughts. Of course, atheist teachings and atheist talk points are meant to stump those who believe. But the overall, you have to understand the overall doctrine and purpose of the Most High. They try to bring in little trivial, little, little points that really doesn't make any sense at all. Well, why would God have a fallen world? The Most High made righteousness from the beginning and gave man free will. Man chose. We had dominion. We could have ruled with the Most High without sin. And chose this world we live in. Therefore now. Man must choose right for the kingdom to come. There will be a new creation. This is Satan's world. That's why. When Adam fell the earth was given into the hand of the wicked. Therefore it's a fallen world. Because it's fallen to what? Judgment. Eventually there will be a judgment. And those that choose right. Will receive the world he's waiting for. But the, but the problem is he's sitting on the side looking at the world, blaming the Most High, instead of becoming a part of the solution. Do what's right. Follow the commandments for the world to come. Nothing is just given to us anymore. J.P. Steve, after reading the book of Jasher, I realized how often the children of Esau rose up against us. Is there a lesson on that? And what are the similarities of how they come at us now? There is lessons on that when we go into who is Edom in the academy. When you look at the Amalekites, you don't need to just go into the book of Jasher to see their imposition against us. I'm speaking of the Edomite rule. And see, we just look at Edom not realizing there's a higher power. Uh, ruling over the Edomites that they get their instructions from which are Canaanites so it's not just an Edomite imposition against us it's a Canaanite rule against us because they're getting their instructions from Canaanites right Hence, more reason for you to get into that Hebrew and Bible Academy. I mean, the, let me tell you, that place is pumping out. That, those teachings every Sunday is pumping out scholars. Right? Go to historytimes.org. You need to be a part of it. All right. Um, Shalom, elders. Hilo from the Panama Canal, great class. All praises be to the Most High. Nice to meet you two Wednesdays ago. <laughs> the day of redemption. Oh, that is that the brother? Is that the brother uh, from New Jersey, Atlantic City? Day of redemption. <laughs> Shalom, elders. Can you tell me when you will be visiting Trinidad? Quite soon. Just keep your head to the ground there. 
Deborah of Judah. Elder, I have a question concerning Samuel. Did he go to hell? That's a good question because uh, we, we see in the scriptures that Saul used a, a medium of, of familiar spirits to raise, to wake Samuel from, from the center of the earth. You have to realize, it tells us in uh, Luke, the 16th chapter, that hell is not just a place of torment. Hades has also the bosom of Abraham, where the righteous rest in profound quiet. So down there is a place to hold souls, righteous and unrighteous. The righteous souls are connected directly to the heavenly realm. They can see over the, uh, the, the stream of water, the torments, once they look over there. But their subject, that realm is, is controlled and subject to the heavenly realm, being protected by angels. So even though the realm is all in the sin of the earth, the righteous realm is connected to the Most High. And no, it's not called hell, even though it's in Hades, the holding of souls. It's called the bosom of Abraham in the midst of Hades. Okay. Uh, daughter of Zion, are there any circumstances where it's okay to lie, cheat, or steal? I think you know the answer to that. I'm thinking about when Abraham lied about Sarah being his sister. Right? Now, was he technically lying? No. <laughs> We're the children of Israel. Technically, when I meet a sister, even if you meet a brother or a sister before y'all become husband and wife, that's just your sister. Right? So technically, Abraham wasn't lying. You know, how you doing, sister? Hey, you got to, you know, uh, I think we should become husband and wife. <laughs> right? Are the people who died prior to Yeshua's return going to be with them on earth? During a thousand years. Yes, they will. Those who die believing in Christ going, uh, going forward is believing Christ in his absence, like we are believing Christ in our absence, look in, in him in our absence, looking back. You still had to believe on Christ. Ezekiel says, Who have believed uh, our report and to whom the, the arm of the of, of, of the Lord is revealed? Isaiah, yeah, excuse me, yes, Isaiah, thank you. The book of Isaiah tell you, who have believed our report, and to whom the arm of the Lord is revealed. So they had to believe in Christ looking forward, like we are believing in Christ in our, in, in our absence. He's not here with us physically, but we believe in him looking back, like they believed in him, looking forward towards his coming. Oh, let's see him. When will be the next Hebrew and Bible Academy? Well, we're only week three in, right? We're only week three in, so if you're not missing anything, we're still within the first month. So you should enroll today to get in tomorrow, and you'll be here for the three months, and what we'll do is we'll make sure you get the three weeks that uh, prior that was missed. Is this the third week? Is the third week coming? Oh, well, we only did two weeks, so it's brand new. So we have extended the enrollment where brothers and sisters can get in this one now, if you would like, and, you know, starting tomorrow. So what you do, go to historytimes.org or go to gatheringofchrist.org and enroll today. And you'll be in. We'll send you your information. Eight o'clock in the morning. Be ready. We going into the. The children of the promise tomorrow. All right. The children of the promise is what we're dealing with tomorrow. All right. Uh, Ak peace. This was this was my lesson. All praises be to a higher. I needed this a lot. All praises. 
Uh, King MJ. Hello, elders. Nice lesson. My question, the 13 colonies of America. Was it coined from the 12 tribes of Israel in the 13th tribe? Not that I know about. It's more so a Masonic, esoteric number, that 13. Can we take vacations? Of course you can. I need one. <laughs> Gadalia. Shalom, elders. We have been in the body for three years. We have been trying to connect and trying to show what we bring, we, we bring to the table with no response. How do we connect? Well, that's open-ended. I don't know, Gadalia, whether or not you are in a congregation. Okay. But what you can do is send an email and we'll try our best to connect you with someone, you know, in your respective areas. Okay? That's what we can do. Okay? Or call us. Uh, the number is 215-253-4448 and leave a message if no one picks up. And we'll, we'll get someone to return the call and find out what's going on with you to, so that you can... You can work because, hey, we need laborers. So, hey, just do that and, 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 and uh, we'll help you. We need you. Okay. Uh, I'll T1. I am in the academy, but I still need baptism. If you need baptism... Let us know so we can link you in with a, a, a connecting body in your respective areas, in your region. So that's more important than, than, than the academy itself. Your baptism is needed, so send us some information so that we can connect you with an elder who can perform the baptism for you. Toot. Is there anyone in Jackson, Mississippi that can, that can do baptisms for some of my friends? Yes, there is. Okay, send an email to gathering as one at AOL.com and we will connect you with the elders in your respective areas there. I understand that the Bible is no contradictions. True. But can you clarify Daniel 7 when it says, He saw a vision in the Most High. And John 4 when it says that no man has seen the Most High. Well, Daniel seen the Most High in a vision. That's not a contradiction. Daniel never seen the Most High walking down the street. So that's not a contradiction. In a vision, he was shown the Most High sitting on a throne where Christ was being brought to him in a prophecy before the falling of all kingdoms. That's different than a man walking down the street and saying, yeah, what's, what's going on, God? Hey, what's happening? It doesn't work like that. So it's no contradiction. A vision is different than you seeing someone in front of you. Okay? But the context of that scripture, that the, the, the proper context and doctrine for that scripture to show you it's talking about seeing someone physically is that how is it we can say we love the most high who we have not seen and hate our brother we see every day. We don't see our brother in a vision. We see our brother and sisters before us and treat them like whatever but claim we love the most high who we've never seen. That's the proper context of that scripture. Okay? So it's, instead of, and that, that's what I'm saying, you have people, atheists out there, not you, who will look for contradictions without getting the meat and wisdom within a particular precept because they're looking for something contradictory. When really they should be dealing with the moral, what I would call uh, uh, the moral reason and the wisdom in the precept for, for their own growth. How can you say you love your brother 
who you see every day, how can you say you love the Most High whom you've not seen, but hate your brother who you see every day? When the Most High is in your brother. You're the, he's the image of the Most High. So that's the proper, you know, thing to pull or, or knowledge or wealth of knowledge to pull from the precept instead of seeing, looking for contradictions. Someone who don't, who's looking for something wrong in the Bible would say, it says seen, no one's seen him. And they'll look at him and say, Daniel's you seen him in a vision. Because they're looking for something wrong and, and therefore... All the, the, the great wisdom from on high that's bestowed in this book just go right by them. I tend not to look for contradictions. I'm there for the wisdom, the understanding, the knowledge, the, the, the direction, the reproof, the correction. See? And the Most High resolves all that. He gives us the understanding and shows that there's no contradiction. Okay? With that, I'm going to say shalom. We're going to pray out and wish you all Godspeed. Shalom.